We're joined now by Wild Trout Trust Director Sean Leonard and he's going to be talking to our President John Beer about well, the sex lives of trout to some degree. Well, not just the sex lives of a trout. It's really, I, I came across a very interesting story the other day and I want to check it with the director. Now, the, the director knows all there is to know about trout. And I came across a story which throws doubt on some of the, uh, the orthodoxies, some of the, the, the Bible stories of trout. Heresy. Excellent. So, John, where does the story start? Well, the story starts for me on a small boat in the middle of Coniston. And I wasn't even fishing for trout, I was fishing for char. And actually, it was on one of the wild trout dust auctions. Um, I'd taken a, a guy out on a, on a boat to fish with my friend Billy. And while we were sitting there in the long intervals between catching fish, the man was chatting about where he lived. And he said he lived round the corner from the man who inherited Edward Gray, Viscount Gray's fishing tackle. Edward Gray, Viscount Gray, was the Foreign Secretary, the long, Britain's longest running Foreign Secretary in the, the years leading up to the First World War. But he wrote this fantastic fishing book, fly fishing book. And in fact, he, he did most of his fishing just yeah, yeah. about 200 yards up, upstream there. He started off in Winchester School, which is just up the road there. And he did most of his fishing for this book. Um, a couple of miles beyond that. So this book is, is, is one of the classics of fly fishing. But he didn't start there. He actually started in Northumberland, fishing little wild stream for little uh, brown trout. And when his grandfather died, when he was about 20, um, he inherited a large estate up there uh, in Northumberland, a place called Falodden. And living the life of a country gentleman, he decided to put in some small artificial lakes. And one of the places he fish, fished was a quarry, an old quarry. And he stocked it with trout in 1887. And um, if I can just read what he said here. Mm. Into this place, 200 yearling Loch Levens were put in May 1887. In the autumn of 1888, the weight of these varied from four ounces to three quarters of a pound. Edward Gray, you've got to understand, was incredibly meticulous about uh, his records. When he fished as a schoolboy there, he wrote down every single fish he caught, when he caught it, how much he weighed. He was an absolute meticulous record keeper. Well, in his records of this little quarry, he records all the fish he, he catches and notices that some of the fish are appearing much smaller than when he put them in. In other words, he was getting recruitment. He was getting spawning in that lake. And he goes through meticulously all the fish he put in, all the fish that have come out, and actually says, look, we've counted the fish we put in, and we've caught more coming out. Um, we've caught more fish than we actually put in. So he's absolutely convinced they were, uh, they were breeding. But this is a quarry without an inlet or outlet stream. It has no inlet, it has no outlet. It just seeps into the quarry and just seeps into the ground outside. So he's very puzzled by this. Um, he, he says that, and it's also very, very steep sided. I've seen this place. I went up last year and I actually looked at the quarry and it's got steep stone sides. There is no possibility of a, of a, a flowing stream. Now, this was a huge puzzle to him. It's a bigger puzzle to me because in the trout, Wild Trout Trust, I'm listening to all you experts telling me about how we've got to make a red for breeding here. Yeah. And now, what exactly does a trout need to spawn? Well, we're sitting quite close to it here, aren't we? We've got lovely sort of gravelly, riffly water behind us, which is the perceived wisdom. This is where these guys are going to spawn, in a river situation. Do they always spawn in rivers? Well, we've thought, I suppose until a lot of the work you've done, that they might spawn an inlet stream. So if they're lake resident trout, they run into a stream to spawn, they might spawn on the outlet side of a, of a lake. But the, the, the sort of perceived wisdom has been Well, that, that's always what I've understood. Um, because I fish up in, up in the highlands quite a bit, in, in the little lockens, and we look for a spawning stream coming in or a spawning stream going out, and we call them spawning streams. Yeah. And if we don't see one, we think, oh, you know, perhaps there aren't gonna be any fish there. Sometimes those are the place where you get the biggest fish, but then I've always understood that that's because fishermen like myself take a little trout from a, a nearby lock, which has got lots of little fish, and 
pop them in there thinking, well, I'll come back in four years and, and catch that when it's huge. Yeah. In other words, we've always assumed that you need running water with gravels, with uh, aerated gravels. I've, I've seen the diagrams yeah. um, to get successful spawning. Yeah. And yet in this particular quarry, there is nothing like that. It's a deep quarry with steep sides and there's no possibility of spawning. Now, this was a huge puzzle to me. First thing I did was to get in touch with you, as I recall, yeah. <clears throat> and said, what the hell's going on here? What you did was to actually point me to a magazine article in Salmo Truta, the, the, the Wild Trout Trust's organ from four years ago, or six years ago, which I'd completely missed, uh, from a man called Marcus Walters. Yeah. Now, what Marcus Walters said was he was on the same path as I was on. He'd been doing some research up in Scotland. They'd been looking at spawning tributaries. They'd been looking at one lock where they looked down into the shallows and actually could see reds. Now, if perhaps you could describe what a red looks like. It's a cleared area of gravel and it's proportional to the size of the fish. So let's say that if it's three feet long in a river situation, then it's generated by a Henfish, it's maybe a foot long. So, like so that. That you can see it and say, oh, yeah. that, that's a red. Clear patch. That's a red. Yeah. Well, this is what he was seeing in, in water two or three metres deep. I so this is clearly yeah. in, 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 a, in a loch, yeah. um, not in, a, in an inflowing stream, not even in the bit of the river, where the, bit of the lake where there is an inflowing stream. This is just on the margins, in the margins, two or three metres. And what he did was to raise the possibility that this was a common occurrence or uh, a relatively common occurrence. He gave some other examples that people had told him. But again, this is all anecdote, it's all story. Um, what he then was, uh, did was in this magazine, in Salmo Truta, was to put a request to the readers to say, had anybody else come across any yeah. uh, bits and pieces like this? I did exactly the same. What I did was to get in touch with you and you put me in touch with researchers around the world. That's your resource. You are my resource. I, I, you know, I'm a journalist and never meant to mention their sources. You are my source. You wrote to some of your colleagues, people who you would trained with or you'd studied under or um, you'd come across in the Wild Trout Trust work and got them to write to me. Yeah. And I have to say, what they wrote was absolutely staggering. So you went to people like Andy Ferguson, Ken Whelan, Well, Chris Ken Conroy. Whelan put me in touch with, with, Ken Whelan himself put me in touch with, I think, uh, half a dozen people around the world. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was sort of all funneled into me like this. And I say, the interesting thing is that everybody says, oh yes, it's well known. It's well known that trout spawn in lakes, but there isn't any scientific research. There's no resource, there's no science on this, or very little science on this. And of course the question is why? And, and Marcus had asked the question in the first article. He'd said, why is there no research? And it, it's fairly obvious. It's, it's rather difficult. If you go to a stream like this, clear water, no, nowhere is more than three foot deep. You can see the reds, you can see the trout spawning. It's much more difficult in a lake. Yeah. Much, much more difficult. But surely we ought to be looking into this. I mean, it, it could be important as our, as our rivers are, are suffering. Some of the lake spawning could be important. And it's important potentially to really unique populations of fish. And I think we saw that in the last edition of Salmo Trutta where Andy Ferguson wrote about different forms of trout living in different parts of the lake and spawning in different parts of yes, the lake and did. streams. Well, he's famous, of course. I'm not, I came across the name uh, Andy Ferguson uh, because he was ooh, 20, 30 years ago talking about three different species yeah. of trout in Loch Melvin. Yeah. And these three different species, to be called species, um, had to spawn separately. In other words, they had to spawn in different places or at different times. Yeah. And as soon as you get spawning in different places, it raises the question, well, some of them are spawning in this stream, some of them are spawning in that stream. One of them, and I think it was the Gillaroo, the Gillaroo, the red one fish. of them was spawning in the bay 
where the river flows out. Now you get a little bit of current in that bay, but not much. And it's, it's this large bay where the, where the trout were spawning in, not still water exactly, but certainly in a lake. That I found very interesting. When he wrote back to me, he was saying, well, yes, it happens there. Can, can I read you some of the things he said? Yeah, do, yeah. Here we are. Uh, right, the big question is to what extent lake spawning occurs in large lowland lakes, especially in Britain and Ireland. In Loch Melvin, Gillaroo spawn in Larine Bay, which the one we just talked about. Yeah. The bay is quite shallow, and as all the water converges there, good flows occur in the winter. A Norwegian colleague snorkeled the bay in January and found lots of reds. Paddy Gargan, inland fisheries, found many fry on a gravel shoal in the middle of Loch Mask. Now, Loch Mask is a large limestone loch. Yeah. Um, it's in, in the middle of that is the, the, the thing about Loch Mask, as I'm sure you know when you, if you try and fish it, is that you've got to be very, very careful not to bump into things yeah. because there's lots and lots of limestone shallows, blocks. lots and lots of rocks rising from nowhere. Now, yeah. they found um, fry on essentially an underwater island in the middle of this lake where the fry had, where the eggs had hatched and there were the fry sitting there. But when they analysed them, they were all brown trout. So they were all brown trout that presumably had spawned on that spot. Um, he, Andy Ferguson goes on. I suspect lake spawning in Orkney, I in Harry, but have no proof at present. It will be important to establish whether lake spawning occurs as it may be important, an important contribution to recruitment. Andy Ferguson wasn't alone. Ken Whelan was finding uh, people who had, um, in New Zealand, they had uh, uh, spawning in, in the lakes. Even Ken Whelan himself had found lake spawning in Ireland in a lot of the locks in, on the wave wash shores. Yeah. And also on the shores of these lakes, you get springs coming up in the shores and he, they were finding reds all the way around the shores on some of these locks. I'm going to go on to Andy Ferguson again. Lake spawning is common in Iceland, where there is frequent upwelling at fissures in the lake. Now, Iceland is, is peculiar because um, um, a lot of the surroundings of the lochs are volcanic. They've been, they, they're the products of an eruption, and it's like pumice stone. The water flows through them, and they find an awful lot of these. Um, trout were spawning where the fissures, where the, the lake water runs from one to another, they can spawn in that movement of water where it comes through. Yeah. But he goes on, and this is the bit that really staggered me. Uh, in Lake Garda, Italy, trout spawning has been shown to occur at 200 yeah, and 300 meters. Yeah. Now, that is just staggering. That is staggering. Uh, there's no question of waves washing the shore there. There's no question of uh, a bit of movement as it goes into a river. We're 200, 300 metres down. Where did they get their oxygen from at that depth? Well, I suppose it could be coming from the, the spring itself. I mean, a lot of the water, these groundwaters are meant to be oxygen poor. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping to find out from Andy Ferguson. He sums it up in the end by saying, a lot of uh, these lake spawning trout can be found in these limestone regions. And that was the bit that absolutely fascinated me because I went to see the quarry that um, Edward Gray had, had been using uh, to, to fish and to breed his trout. There's a massive building at one end of it. It looks like an old ruin. It looks like an old castle. If you poke through the underground, you can see that what it is is a lime kiln. Yeah. And when I went back to the um, maps of the region at the time he was um, using his lake, it's marked disused lime quarry. And so this was just another example of water coming through the cracks of the limestone, welling up through the bottom, and the trout able to spawn within that uh, still water. We've got lots of locks like that, yeah. lakes like that, yeah. around the world and in this country. For all we know, 
all the time now we're getting these reports of different populations of trout. We're getting them uh, with the genetic studies. We're finding them in, in various locks in uh, Scotland, in Ireland, where you're getting these different species of trout. Some of those could easily be spawning actually within the lake. Yes. Andy makes one more really interesting thing, interesting point, that trout need just about the same conditions as char for spawning. If anything, char need a little bit more oxygen. They're a bit more oxygen dependent. We have populations of char in Britain that breed and have been breeding for the last 10,000 years in lakes with no problem at all. Yeah. Some char breed in rivers, but most breed in lakes. We don't know what's going on down there. That's a fact. <laughs> and it could be that it is really quite normal. It's just that we don't see it. I was looking through all the literature on this and I came across one very, very interesting one. This is in the Baltic. and I'm going to finish up with this one. This is by a guy called Limburg and Pals who were talking about the sea trout in the Baltic and they were saying that you can measure the, um, the amount of time that the sea trout has spent in fresh water as a, as a youngster by the uh, utoliths in its ear, as I understand it, yeah. by looking at the chemical composition of that. You can see just how long it's spent in, in fresh water, whether it's spent one year, two years. Well, they have some sea trout in the Baltic which seem to have spent no time in fresh water. <laughs> okay. So they actually spawned in salt water. Is the implication, yes. Is the implication. Yes. We have a lot to learn. We do have a lot <laughs> to learn. Yes. Thank you, John. <laughs>